This is a production of Cornell University. All righty. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matthew Fenn. I'm in the Giovanoni Lab, and uh, I'd like to talk to you all a little bit about my research looking at fruit color variation, specifically through the lens of wild solanum relatives. So a few quick words on tomato. So tomato was originally referred to as the tomato. That is the Nahuatl word for tomato. Uh, tomato is unique in that its center of origin, which encompasses Peru, Ecuador, and the Galapagos Islands, is distinct from its center of domestication, which is up a little bit northward in Central America. Its initial range of cultivation might have extended as far south or north as the southwestern United States, so modern day New Mexico and Arizona. And currently, tomato is regarded as a vegetable crop, I put that in quotes because it's a fruit, um, of global value. Um, now, not only is it something that's pretty amenable to growth in the right field conditions, but it's also highly, highly tractable to growth in the greenhouse. So this makes it a global crop of interest. Furthermore, tomato is valuable to us because it's amenable to transformation, <clears throat> sorry, as well as tissue culture. And it's also interfertile with many wild solanum relatives. So not only is it an economically important crop, it is also a valuable model species. Now, specifically, my focus of interest in tomato is looking at carotenoid pigments. Carotenoids are a class of pigments, as the title says, they're pretty important. And they're important for a variety of reasons. Uh, from the human perspective, first and foremost, carotenoids are nutritionally important. Beta carotene is a vitamin A precursor necessary for proper vision and immunity. Likewise, lycopene is an antioxidant. Uh, in addition to this, carotenoid pigments are also important for flavor and aromal volatile synthesis, which is uh, pretty impactful in consumer acceptability of fruit beyond tomato, fruit quality beyond tomato. Apocrotinoid metabolites underpin flavor volatile synthesis and tomato as well as melon and a variety of other soft fruits. And finally, plant protection. <clears throat> Xanthophyll pigments are involved in protecting leaves as well as developing fruit tissue when it's still in the green stage from photo damage. Now, my means of exploring carotenoids and carotenoid variation in tomato is going to be assisted by the use of three distinct breeding populations derived from crosses with wild relatives. So to the bottom, oh, whoopsie daisy. Oh, I'm going in the opposite direction here. Ah, bear with me, everybody. Ah, spoiler alert. Okay, here's my laser. So here we have Salinum pimpinella folium, which is the red-fruited direct progenitor of cultivated tomato. Um, it's a fun plant. I'm not going to be looking at it. The IL populations I'm looking at are derived from crosses with the relative Solanum habricates, Solanum lycoprisicoides, and Solanum panellii. Uh, these are really wonderful, very, very hardy plants. They are well suited to growing in incredibly dry desert conditions with high UV indices. So they're incredibly interesting to study. And as you can see from the phylogenetic tree to the left here, Lycoprisicoides, which is right down here, out of the three ancestors, it is the most genetically distant from cultivated tomato. Penelia and Habricates being about genetically equidistant from tomato. <clears throat> and now a brief review on what I mean when I say an introgression line population. Introgression lines are distinct from recombinant inbred lines in that one develops an introgression line population through a biparental cross, typically with a commercially relevant recurrent parent and a wild donor parent, and then subsequent back crossing of the F1 hybrid to the commercially relevant recurrent parent. And what you get is a population that, yes, has relatively low genetic resolution and that these introgressions are pretty large at times, sometimes spanning multiple megabases. But you do get a pretty nice sliding window of the donor, the wild parent uh, genome, in the background of your commercial cultivar. Now, specifically, my research question and goals uh, concern the following. I want to know which loci and or allelic variants within and peripheral to the carotenoid biosynthetic pathway mediate carotenoid accumulation and profile variation in tomato fruit. And I just want to specify that when I talk about carotenoid profiles, I am talking about the concentrations of individual pigments, namely phytoene, phytofluene, lycopene, which is the most uh, highly accumulated pigment in ripe tomato, beta carotene, alpha carotene, and others. Um, so to this end, I have leveraged existing carotenoid and transcriptomic data from these three populations in order to identify specific introgressions that are associated with instances of carotenoid variation. And upon mapping these introgressions, 
to resolve genomic bins that contain potential regulators unique to or common across populations. I hope to isolate or identify a potential candidate loci using a functional genomic analysis. So a quick review of my methods. Oh, that got echoey all of a sudden. Um, so my genotyping has been done using a single end RNA seq reads. So this is my means through calling SNPs and identifying uh, specific introgression region boundaries. Um, specifically, I used the Genome Analysis Toolkit Pipeline, GATK, in order to call SNPs. I should specify that these populations, which have been used for quite a few years now, have been previously genotyped using CAPS and RFLP markers, which, while valuable in and of themselves, are a bit lower resolution than calling SNPs. And in terms of my phenotypic data, I have acquired carotenoid profile data for phytoene, alpha beta carotene, and lycopene, as well as others, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, and I have used this data to specifically identify introgression line individuals from each population that display statistically significant variation in their carotenoid profiles. Uh, and I did this using a post hoc test called the NET test. And I want to draw everyone's attention briefly to this insertion map here. So this is from the S. Penelii, Solan and Penelii IL population. In blue, you have chromosomes 1 through 12, tomato has 12 chromosomes. And then in black, you have uh, basically integrations. So integrations, as you can see, overlap in some cases, and there are also gaps. One would create a bin map by delineating the regions of overlap, as well as the gaps between each integration. And that is what I have done. So we see here a bin map I have for chromosome six. Uh, it's interrupted a little bit by the zoom icon, but whatever. So I'd like to draw everyone's attention to uh, bin 6F. And I also want to specify that these red bars you see, that represents an integration. So do you want to hide the controls? Uh, it's not slide. It's fine. Thanks, Ben. So each introgression here corresponds to an introgressed region from a wild donor, in this case, like a Persicoides, in a single individual. Uh, in red, I have like a Persicoides introgressions. In yellow, I have Penelii introgressions. And so what we have here in bin 6F is an enzyme called lycopene beta cyclase. Uh, tomato has multiple paralogs of lycopene beta cyclase, three to be exact, I believe. This one is specifically expressed in the chromoplast, which is the organelle that accumulates carotenoids specifically. And so what you see here from looking at the, uh, the results of the transcriptome data from these populations is that the lycopersicoides and the Penelii specific lycopene beta cyclase is expressed far higher fold in IL individuals containing these isoforms than in individuals that express the wild type enzyme. And so this is pretty interesting. And unsurprisingly, this results in a high beta carotene phenotype I, in the fruit specifically. And I want to specify that lycopene beta cyclase is involved, uh, as the name implies, conversion of lycopene to beta carotene. So um, in, in, in noticing this variation in expression, I wanted to look at the region upstream of the start codon for this enzyme. Um, I also did an alignment between the amino acid sequence from the tomato-specific, like a Persicoides and Penelii-specific lycopene beta cyclases. Um, and the enzyme is pretty well conserved uh, in terms of its amino acid sequence. There was, it was around a 90, 97% match. Uh, that is not the case for the upstream sequence, which may contain potential promoter sequences. Uh, as Charlie did a nice job explaining, finding the exact location of the promoter sequence can be a bit tricky. But as you can see here, uh, relative to like a persicum, there are a number of insertions and deletions, sometimes comprising multiple base pairs that are present in this upstream region. And for your reference, I also did want to include some pictures of the fruit. IL-6-3 is, is the high beta IL line from the Penelii population. You can see it's pretty orange relative to the wild type. Likewise, 4254 is my IL line of interest from the like a persicoides population. And it displays a similar phenotype in that it is far more orange, far higher beta, far higher beta carotene accumulation relative to VF36, which was the recurrent parent used in that population. And so finally, I mentioned that I'm also interested in potential loci residing outside of the biosynthetic pathway. And now looking instead at chromosome 5 and zoning in on bins 5F and 5G, um, I consulted the transcriptome data across the three populations in order to find potential genes of interest 
Um, if anyone's interested in my cutoff values or criteria for selecting genes based on transcriptome data, I can tell you. Um, but I decided to look at a lower beta carotene and lutein phenotype, and I selected uh, genes of interest based upon whether or not they have previously described functions, and also if they describe or if they display a higher fold or lower fold expression of greater than positive or negative 0.5. And so of particular interest to me are an R2, R3 MIB transcription factor, as well as an SLNAP1 NAC family transcription factor. So both of these are of interest to me because MIB, as well as NAC family transcription factors, are known to regulate carotenoid biosynthesis and overall ripening progression, respectively, in tomato. And in particular, this R2, R3 MIB transcription factor, I haven't shown the number here, but it displays uh, a pretty high correlation of around 0.95 with lycopene beta cyclase, which is the enzyme I described on the previous slide. Uh, and likewise, R2, R3 MIB transcription factors, specifically subgroup six, are known to regulate flavonoids uh, in some instances in addition to carotenoids. And finally, uh, this SLNAP1 has been described in a previous study to influence chlorophyll degradation as well as uh, sugar accumulation in ripening tomato fruits. So both might be of interest going forward. And finally, next steps in future directions uh, are threefold. Uh, I am in the process of continuing my selection of genes of interest, specifically, and some of you are going to laugh at how big this uh, size is, but I'm looking at bins of around a megabase or less, hopefully. Uh, less work for me if they're less. Um, and I specifically want bins that encompass three or more ILs and that have consistent clean phenotypes. Um, I will refine my selection of genes of interest by looking at whether or not they display correlation with pathway enzyme expression. Um, and also if they have previously described functions. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, I have a goal of carrying out a functional genomic analysis with select genes of interest through CRISPR-Cas9 and viral-induced gene silencing. With that, I would like to thank uh, you all for your attention, as well as my lab, Giovanoni Lab, my committee, uh, and all collaborators. I should mention, <laughs> I forgot to add a uh, a name of one of our illustrious postdocs, Vincent Colantonio, is also a member of our lab. I thank him for his help as well, particularly in doing my alignments. Um, and I would open, I will open it now for questions. So thank you. Charlie, when would you use CRISPR versus FIGS? Um, so that's a good question. So CRISPR, CRISPR is great in that you're able to generate stably transformed lines. VIGS would be good if I, for instance, find that I have a high number of genes of interest to test and I want to do transient transformation instead of going to the lengths of generating stably transformed lines. CRISPR is a little bit more time intensive. Um, it has its perks and its drawbacks. Viral induced gene silencing, I could generate a construct carrying potential antisense sequences for multiple genes, um, sometimes in combination. Uh, and it, it, could be a better large scale approach. Keeping? Yeah. So you have um, one max base uh, region, right? It's quite large. I, mean, yes. I wonder if you have like a um, plan to do fine mapping or just fix, focus on the uh, candidate gene approach? Yeah. Um, ideally, I'd like to integrate both. And so um, a fine mapping approach could be taken with. Uh, some of the other resources that we have. We have uh, carotenoid and transcriptome data for a Pimpinella folium population. And there's also a Bacross inbred line population derived from the Pinellii uh, IL population. So that's something that could be used to, to supplement my current approach um, and add some power to selection of candidate genes. And that would enable fine mapping. Based on the analysis of your different populations, how effective is integration in tomatoes? I'm sorry. How effective is introversion in tomatoes? It oh, first? it really it depends entirely on the ancestor that you're looking at. And so it's Penelia. Uh, so ideally, with introgression lines, you want to generate individuals that have a, a homozygous insertion in the genome. Uh, that's not possible with all the ancestors. Lycopersicoides is particularly messy because it has self incompatibility, um, and also you you don't have perfect matching of the chromosomes during uh, meiosis. So with, you know, with a relative that's not so distant, like Pimpinella folium, you'll be able to generate an introgression line population, no problem. With Penelia, no problem. Lycopersicoides, 
or something a little more genetically distant, uh, going back to the tree, that would be a little bit more challenging, but still feasible. You would just have to deal with uh, heterozygous integrations in some cases, which still have their value, but it's a little uh, it's a little harder to interpret. Yes. In terms of uh, testing the function of candidate gene. Yes. Uh, is it possible that you can test in the autopsies first? I mean, that it's much faster and then you can get more confidence before getting to the late. Yes, that, that could be a good approach. Um, it's, uh, or alternatively, it would be also good to use a, a model similar to Arabidopsis, but that also displays soft fruit. Because um, we are, we're interested in how, and specifically how a lot of these candidate genes mediate the progression of ripening or parameters of the fruit that you observe during ripening. But Arabidopsis, for a, a gene that also might display a phenotype in the vegetative phase, that could be a, that could be a very good approach. Mike Ware. Have you seen ever any like feedback in the pathway in a sense, like depending on what allele you have at a gene, could you possibly have like lower total uh, amounts of like various compounds? I'm, I'm just curious because we, we've seen some of that in maize. In yeah. Our pathway, so I'm just curious if you've seen that also in tomatoes. Um, so just to make sure I understand the question correctly, you're talking, so if I have, for instance, higher fold beta carotene, yeah. might I observe lower fold accumulation of other pigments? Of, of even like fold carotenoids, yeah. Yeah. Um, that isn't something that I have personally observed yet. Okay. I probably will in the future. I will say actually that the lycoprosecoides isoforms of lycopene beta cyclase, those, um, those are expressed at much lower fold uh, RPKM values in tomato, and that actually allows for accumulation of more lycopene. Yeah. Um, and so it's, I was actually, I was reading a paper last night talking about how selection uh, led to these genes with lower fold expression so that you would get red fruit. Um, yeah, so in, in maize it was a situation where we had lower activity of red of RB1. Okay. And, and that also resulted in like, uh, lower amounts of total carotenoids, which you wouldn't expect. So there's some type of feedback going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. There's also the, uh, the interplay between carotenoids and ethylene oh, yeah. in tomato, um, which you observe in, in some other crops, in some cases not, it really runs a spectrum. But, but yeah, there does, there does seem to be in some cases a feedback, certainly between um, as you accumulate carotenoids and the amount of flux going through the pathway. Thank you, everyone. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.